Good morning, camp meeting family. Did you sleep well? Did you get an extra shower this morning? <laughs> On your way here? You know, every year I bring an umbrella, but since it didn't rain last year, I said, I'm not going to take my umbrella this year. <laughs> that wasn't wise, but thanks to Brother George, he had an umbrella and we were able to share it. On our way here, I hope everyone is, is well and you're not affected by the rain. The Lord is good all the time. All the time. The Lord is good. Yes, He is. Have you begin to make a list of persons that you will pray, pray for? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You know, many times we say we're going to pray for someone, and we just say it, and then we forget about it. I'm the kind of person that I will forget, so I have to write it down. I have to make sure that <clears throat> what, what I say I want to be able to fulfill. And rather than just, just saying some nice words to someone, yes, we'll pray for you. No, no. I want to make sure that I, if I say I'm going to pray, and so <clears throat> I'll share with you my testimony. As soon as I stop speaking with that person, I pray immediately, no matter where I'm at. By God's grace, I pray immediately because I know what will happen. I said, I forgot to pray. No, I pray immediately. And the Bible says you pray without ceasing. So any time is a good time for prayer. Amen? Any time is a good time for prayer. <clears throat> so I want to encourage you to continue to be intercessors. Part of prayer, we heard Pastor Davis yesterday talking a little bit about prayer, is intercess intercession for our brethren. To feel the, 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 the need that they feel, the, the pain that they feel, the, the desires in their heart. You know, try to put yourself in them and, and, and be a part of their lives that way. And, and that God will bless you and bless the person you are praying for. You know, I'll be honest with you. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's not a water issue, but thank you. What it is is I have allergies, and in the morning I always have a little bit of of of, of this um, coughing and what have you, but it goes away. Um, you know, I'll, I'll be honest with you. Getting up here every morning uh, makes me a little nervous. Not because of myself, brothers and sisters. I I had no problem making a fool out of myself when I was in the world. So it's not about making a fool out of myself. But I'm worried that I would put, be self-sufficient and too self-confident to be up here. I said, Lord, I don't want anything to obstruct what you're trying to do, especially in a meetings like these. People have traveled. People have made, uh, 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 put work aside and have made special effort to be here. And the last thing that I want to do, Lord, is, is, is put self on the, on the front altar there and be an obstacle for you to speak to us. And so I pray this morning that, the Holy Spirit will speak to you as he does, and he speaks to me. Uh, we are just instruments in his hands, and he has chosen us to be here today. And so by God's glory, that's what we want to do, be an instrument in his hands. <clears throat> I want to repeat some of the uh, a, a quote that we received in the consecration letter that is very key to what we've been studying <clears throat> about prayer. You know, none of the speakers that you've heard before do we talk and relate uh, the things that we will be uh, sharing? But, it, it, you know, when I hear Pastor Davis, Elder Marcus, and, you know, and, and, and I say, Lord, these are the things that have been weighing down on my heart. We need more prayer. I need more prayer. I need to, to, for you to guide me to better structure my prayer, to be efficient and, and effective in my prayer, Lord, you know, so that there is a, a power of change in my life and in my family. And so that's been on my burden is, is prayer, you know, and, and the, the other thing is, 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 is godliness. And I will repeat, you know, I'm going to read this quote again because I think it's important. Um, <clears throat> you know, one, one, uh, one individual one time asked their, their, their minister, he said, why, why do you preach that same sermon every Sabbath? He says, I have to preach it until the church finally gets it, you know. And so repetition is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. And uh, I want to read to you the quote that I read to you yesterday from Review and Herald. It says, a revival of true godliness among us is the greatest and most urgent of all our needs. Isn't that what we've been hearing? Urgency? <clears throat> you see, revival and reformation <clears throat> is the urgency that, that makes this exodus. It, it's, it's all in the same harmony with what we've been hearing. The revival and the reformation will produce my doing and my going forth with what God's plan is for the last days. To seek this should be our first work. 
by the way, brothers and sisters, you can't have an exodus without revival and reformation. If you do, you're just going to be, uh, I remember Elder Mason used to say, you know, we, sometimes we think we're in this big uh, jumbo jet on our way to heaven, and we're like, you know, and the plane's taking off, and yeah, we're on our way to heaven. No, no, it's not like that. We have to make this an individual work, a revival or reformation individually. It says to seek this is our, mo- our, our should be our first work. There must be earnest effort to obtain the blessing of the Lord. There must be earnest effort to obtain the blessing of the Lord. Not because God is not willing to bestow his blessing upon us. So God is willing to abundantly bless us. But it is not, but because we are, are unprepared to receive it because we are unprepared to receive it. There are persons in the church who are not converted and who will not unite in earnest, prevailing prayer. See that? I'm going to repeat that. There are persons in the church who are not converted and who will not unite in earnest, prevailing prayer. That means that prayer is going to be a part of our revival. Prayer is going to be part of our reformation. It cannot be just an external behavior and uh, an external uh, evidence. It's going to be from within. We must enter upon the work individually. And the people must be taught not to be satisfied with a form of godliness without the spirit and power. Isn't that what we read in 2 Timothy chapter 3 yesterday? That there will be a form of godliness, but this, but... Uh, denying the power thereof. So we need, brothers and sisters, a formal, and that's why we're having these meetings. That's why we're going through this, 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 th- these words of Christ, which is, in reality, is righteousness by faith. The theme, the central theme of the Bible is the plan of redemption, is it not? We've heard that. The central theme of the Bible is the plan of redemption. In the plan of redemption, at the core of it, is righteousness by faith. Righteousness by faith is from Genesis to Revelation. And this is what this should be our first work, is to be part of this uh, uh, calling that Jesus has, has made, made, made to us. I want us to go to our Bibles this morning before we begin. And before we go there, <clears throat> I want to share with you just a quick testimony. Every day I speak with my wife because I miss her. I speak with my children because I miss them. And, and yesterday my wife, uh, my mother-in-law, uh, yesterday morning, she was my mother-in-law was with us for about two two months, and every morning my mother-in-law would join us for worship, and we've been studying. And like I said before, we had been studying through the book of Daniel, and I saw something different in my mother-in-law. My mother-in-law was much more attentive. She, you know, we were reading straight from the Bible, and my wife shares with me. She said that you know yesterday before she left, they had worship together. They had you know family devotion. And my mother-in-law asked my wife, by the way, my mother-in-law is a devout Catholic. I, 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 meant, I meant to say that. She's a devout Catholic, a very devout Catholic, very active in the church. And she told my wife yesterday, she says, can, can, I, can I pray today? And my, my wife said, of, of course you can. And she went, they got on her knees and they prayed. And my wife says that in her prayer, she says, Lord, I understand now that I need to give my heart to you. You know, my wife, my, my mother-in-law would share She shared this with me recently. She goes, you know, I've been a Catholic for over 60-something years, and I'm beginning to realize that I don't know the Bible. And I praise God for that because that's the work of the Holy Spirit, not not of us. And so she asked my wife, she says, can I pray? And she says, Lord, I understand that I need to give my heart to you. Then she sent me a text before she got on the plane. She said, thank you. You know, I love you, and and, and I, I continue to pray for you and your family that you be guided. And at those meetings, that the Holy Spirit will be with you. And I thought of it as, wow, I've never seen a text so, so uh, detailed from my mother-in-law. She, but, but what happens next is what's interesting. My wife called me a later part of that day, and I said, did your mother get home safely and, and everything? She goes, do you have a minute? I go, yes. She says, you'll never believe what happened. When my mother gets on the plane, my wife says, they were about an hour before her destination. She says, all of a sudden, there began to be turbulence in the air. And and out of nowhere, she said that the plane started to shake. And all of you have been been on an airplane, you know, when you hit some turbulence. But she said, it started to get very bad. 
that even she said that even when 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 the uh, when the the ladies that are there serving you, what are they called? Uh, steward, right? Stewardess. When they get nervous, then you know something's wrong. And she said that they could see that they were nervous and they were pacing. They were trying to hold. And she said now it was shaking so much that the uh, oxygen masks are are open now. Kids are crying and the plane is trembling. And the captain begins to announce, "We're going to have to take a detour. We don't know where this came from." And she says that you know the, the, even the captain sounded nervous. And she said that all of a sudden, the captain says, I'm going to allow you for this time, we normally don't do this, to make a phone call to your loved ones. And my mother-in-law said, oh, man, is this for them allowing us to, to, to say goodbye to our loved ones? Because you know, normally in an airplane, you can't turn your phones on. She says, I guess they were low enough to the ground. She says, I'm going to allow you this time to turn your phones on. And the plane was shaking and kids are crying. My mother-in-law uh, my voice is that my mother-in-law began to pray with the person next to her. And, and, and the airplane finally took a, almost an a hour turn, and, and they, they spent more than an hour in the air trying to, to go around this, this storm that they were facing. And, and everybody was frightened, and women crying, and children crying. And, and I said to myself, I said, you know, honey, that is the devil. The devil was trying to kill my mother-in-law be sure she fully surrenders her heart to the Lord. And I remember a couple years back, she was going into operation. They had found breast cancer, and she didn't know. You know, She began to tell everybody that she loved them. And I told my, my wife was worried. I said, honey, you don't have to be worried. Your mother, and I say it in the name of Christ, is not going to die. The Lord has not finished the work that he has begun in her. You can be sure of that, because the Bible says that my word will not come back void. He says, she's not done. She's not going to die. She will, look, we, if we pray, we have to believe that what we pray will be answered. We've been praying for her, have we not? That the Lord will, will, will fully bring her and she will be completely converted and, and accept Christ. So we have to believe as it already is. And so by God's grace, I do wanted to share that testimony with you because this, this battle that we face, and, and let's, go, let's go to our Bibles, Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 6, a very well-known verse. In Ephesians chapter 6, we know what we are up against. Ephesians chapter 6, and we're going to go to verse 12. We already know what we are facing, and, and, and sometimes we need to be reminded. I believe that sometimes we need to be reminded that what we are facing is precisely what Paul writes here in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. You see, brothers and sisters, we need to be reminded that what we're dealing with is a spiritual battle. The great controversy, the great controversy is this great battle between Jesus and Satan. And that battleground, you know where it's at? Our heart. That's the battleground. And this battleground that we are facing that is not of flesh and blood, it is the battle that the, Lord, that, that the enemy is trying to, to attack us is in our heart. That's what we've been hearing, brothers and sisters. We need, we need to see that our greatest need is a, is a revival and a reformation. Our greatest need is Jesus in our hearts. Not knowing of Jesus. You know, when we read the three angels' message, we don't need... A, a, a just a simple knowledge of Jesus. We need the experience that Jesus experienced. We need that experience. And so as we begin this morning, I want us to get on our knees and once again consecrate ourselves in, at the beginning of this meeting unto the Lord. Will you join me with, by getting on your knees? Father in heaven, your inspired word says, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Lord, what are we that thou art mindful? We thank you, Lord, for considering us this morning, for giving us another morning that we can wake up and be amongst the living. Thank you, Lord, for the new opportunity you give us, Lord, to draw closer to you. Lord, we ask this morning that your spirit, Lord, will descend like a mist into our hearts, into our minds, Lord. And we'll bring about that
transforming power. May we do the work that is necessary to receive your spirit. May we open our hearts, Lord, this morning to you, to hear your voice speak to us. Please, Lord, we know we are learning that the time is urgent, Lord. Time is at hand. We are living in pearliest times, Lord. And you're showing us, Lord, that there is not much time left. We need to get ourselves ready, and we need to help others, loved ones, friends, brethren, understand the urgency to get all things ready. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> We are studying in the book of Matthew, chapter 5, if you'll go with me. In the book of Matthew, chapter 5, we are reading what Jesus, <clears throat> this sermon on the Mount of Blessings was a key sermon so, so that we would understand what exactly Jesus is trying to take us as an experience. The, what we're reading here, brothers and sisters, as I said before, is what we find throughout the entire Bible. Throughout the entire Bible, Jesus is always appealing to man. Throughout the entire Bible, Jesus is always giving us the science of how to get rid of self and how God wants to abide in us. Throughout the entire Bible, Jesus over and over is continually working to save us. And here Jesus lays out step by step what, 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 what is for us to be what we ought to do in order to achieve this. I want to read to you on page 13 the book Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing. Throughout the Beatitudes, there is an advancing line of Christian experience. So, in other words, what the prophet is saying that throughout these steps in the Beatitudes, it is an experience that you and I need to obtain. There is an experience that you and I need to uh, come to grips with and experience so that we will see what God, how God will take us into the fullness of his righteousness. We studied yesterday that Jesus, in the middle of his ministry, begins his discourse here, and he begins with the first beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We understood that this is a continual state in which we are to be. It's not a state where we are poor and we will now eventually be rich and now we have something to boast about. We understood this and we studied it yesterday. That the poor in spirit is a mindset that we need to obtain in order for the kingdom of heaven to continue to be ours. And that mindset is that I am unworthy. And I will be unworthy for eternity when I am with Christ. The mindset that Jesus is saying here is one that we can recognize and look and say, Lord, there is nothing good in me except it be you and me. The second beatitude that we read is, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Luke says, Blessed are they that weep. And this weeping comes from what, brothers and sisters? Do you remember? What does it come from? From the guilt of my sin, from the guilt of my wrong, right? This, this mourning comes from, from the, the way I continue to behave over the same stumbling blocks that, con that I continue to stumble, and say, Lord, please, please give me victory over this. That is the weeping, and Jesus promises us that you will be comforted, that Jesus will come to our aid, and we he will not leave us comfortless. And so as we continue <clears throat> going on in this, in this process, in, this, in, these, in these steps that Jesus has given us, we continue with the third beatitude, and it says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. <clears throat> blessed are the meek. What is Jesus trying to say by blessed are the meek? What is Jesus trying to say by blessed are the meek? 
if we <clears throat> if we go right there in the in the book of Matthew <clears throat> And we go to chapter 11, go a few chapters forward. <clears throat> For those of you that follow the quarterly, we just had this in our quarterly, but I want us to go back to chapter 11. And if, and if you remember in chapter 11, Jesus is rebuking. Jesus is, 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 is chastising. And at the end of this chastisement, Jesus finishes. It's so interesting how unique Jesus was. He did not chastise and leave it at chastisement. You know, one of the things that <clears throat> we have to learn as parents is that even when we chastise our children and we correct them, at the end of that correction, we need to show them that we love them. You cannot chastise them and then go away angry. You do harm to your child. You do harm when you chastise and then you leave angry. See, Jesus didn't do that here. In Matthew chapter 11, Jesus chastises, and look at how he ends these words. In verse 28, and you all know the verse, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Labor how? Does he mean labor like working and construction and carpentry and mechanic and your job? What kind of labor is Jesus talking about? Well, he just talked about it. You labor in your own self-righteousness. You labor in your own self-sufficiency. You labor trying to do things on your own. He says, come unto me, because, you know, it gets tiresome trying to do things on your own, doesn't it? Have you ever noticed? You almost feel like, man, this, this is hard. This is so hard. And I've heard it. Well, that's because you are trying to do things on your own. And that's what the Pharisees had done. The Pharisees had taken the gospel and put it over the people as this big, heavy backpack that they were carrying around. The gospel was burdensome. It was, it was a heavy, disgusting, even at times. You, 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 just, you almost didn't want to be, I wish I wasn't an Israelite. I would think to myself, the way, the, the way we read, the way this, this burden was upon the people, you'd be like, man, what a burden. What a burden that not only did God give us law and they inter incorrectly interpreted, they add all of these other laws and they made it such a burden. I think I told you I've done <clears throat> some work for uh, several Jewish communities, and, and, and it's interesting some of the things that they do in their buildings. And I don't know if you know this, but in, in, in the Orthodox Jewish buildings, when you get in their buildings and their elevators, when you step in, you cannot press a button because that's labor. So they set up, they program their elevators so that they stop in each floor. As you, as you get in the elevator, it stops in each floor because if you press the button, it's labor. It's labor. And you know that they cannot warm food on the Sabbath. If they want it warm, they have to warm it before the sunset, and they have to uh, either leave it very low so that it, it stays warm, or they have to do something to protect it and cover it, because to warm something up on the Sabbath is, is, is work on the Sabbath for them. They literally still count their steps. They cannot go too far, because their steps, if they go too far, they'll use them up. They have to measure the amount of steps that they take. Do you imagine the burden that, God's people felt, the burden that they had put upon them. You know, we can do that sometimes. We can, we can take the gospel when we are not converted and have a theory and have a mind and then make others feel intimidated by what we know and you put a burden and a pressure on them and they, don't, they, they despise the gospel. And we, give, and we cause more harm to the gospel than good. That's why we need to be converted, brothers and sisters. And what we're going to read next is exactly what Jesus is telling us that we need for the gospel to be sweet, to be attractive, to be a desirable. Jesus came to bring back that savor, the, the savor, the, the, the taste to the gospel. That's why he lived not like no other man. That's why he spoke like no other man. And Jesus begins to say, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Now, what kind of meek was Jesus talking about here? What is meekness? Meekness is the, in, the intention of doing nothing good other than good for others. 
Meekness is that your, your full intention is to always do good unto others. That is what the, the definition of this word means here in, in, in this verse. Jesus' intention was always to do good. He says, learn of me. Jesus says, look, in order for you to rest, see, we, 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 by the way, this word rest doesn't mean that, you know, you sit down and, and just rest and just, and just listen. No, this, this word rest actually means simply rest from what you are doing and because he, obviously he's telling, take upon you my yoke. So he's not telling you to rest per se, like stop what you're doing. Stop what you're doing that is not, that is unrighteous, that your own righteousness is as a filthy rags. But take now my righteousness, and let me explain to you my righteousness. My righteousness is meek. It is to try and do good unto others. It is to look for the, be the benefit of others before you seek for self. It begins with an unselfish action that, 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 that we, is produced when we come to know Jesus. And lowly. What is lowly? It means gentle and humble. Gentle and humble. That's why the gospel is sweet in the, in the, in the right perspective of how Jesus gave it and how he lived it. That's why because you know, the, 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 the psalmist understood this, that, it is, that Jesus is sweeter than honey because he was gentle and humble in heart. And ye shall find rest unto your souls. And really, the word souls here in, 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 in the Greek is shoka, which means life. You will find rest unto your life. Your life will be a content life. Your life will be a satisfied life. That's what Jesus wants. He ultimately wants us to be happy. What Jesus, amen for that, amen. What ultimately Jesus does is he, he not only wants to save us, yes, he wants to save us, but he wants us to be happy. And we can be happy in this world and in the world to come. In spite of the circumstances. And that's what Jesus wants. For us to learn to be content in whatever situation we are in. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Verse 30. Now, he's not saying that the yoke is easy again, per se. There's actually, the, 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 the word krestos in Greek, there's actually not a good word to translate in English. The word actually easy is, is, is fit for what is good for you. What is going to be best for you. For my yoke is what is going to be best for you. It's not that it's easy because there's nothing easy about dying to self, is there? There's nothing easy about giving up what I want. That's why as you draw closer to Jesus, you find out that this is, this is what is best. My yoke is what is best for you, and my burden is light. That's why he said, look, the burden you're carrying is a heavy burden. My burden is light. You remember the example I gave you with my son yesterday? You try to carry that son all by yourself, it's going to be very heavy. But if you allow me to help you, the weight that you're going to carry is going to be much easier. So Jesus is inviting us, inviting us to take upon the burden that is a light burden, that the one that he offers us, the one that is best for our life. Let us go back to Matthew chapter 5 and, and see what meek Expound more on, 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 on blessed are the meek. Let us expound more on blessed are the meek. I'm reading on page 14 now. Patience and gentleness under, on, under wrong were not characterized, prized by the heathens of the Jews. Patience and gentleness under wrong were not characterized, prized by the heathens of, uh, or by the Jews. In other words, to be patient and to be loving was a sign of weakness to the leaders of the time of Jesus. Isn't that amazing? To us, it's, it seems almost foreign because we've, we've, you know, we've learned so much. Uh, but, but to be kind and loving and gentle and forgiving was, was no, 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 no. A Pharisee would never even think of being that. They thought of the law as being stern and being dogmatic. 
very opposite of what Jesus was. This is why this was a shock to the leadership because the, the, the meekness and the love that Jesus came with was, was opposite. What, what is this guy doing, they would think? He's showing signs of weakness. The statement made, made by Moses under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that he was the most meekest man under the, uh, upon the earth would not have been regarded by the people of his time as a commendation. It would be rather have excited pity or contempt. You see, you don't hear the Pharisees exalting the fact that Moses was a humble man, do you? Do we ever read that? Do you ever see that anywhere? They didn't. But Jesus placed meekness among the first qualifications for his kingdom. I want to repeat that again. But Jesus placed meekness among the first qualifications for his kingdom. What did we say meekness was? To seek the best for who? For others. <clears throat> Unselfishness. Unselfishness. You know, sin, all it really is, is selfishness. That's all sin really is. Sin is selfishness. And so he puts among the first qualifications for his kingdom, meekness. In his own life and character, the divine beauty of this, of his, of this precious grace is revealed. It is in the character of Jesus that this is revealed. And this is the only way that I believe that one can come to Christ. When I look at my life, when I look at how my thinking and my behavior, my condition, the times <clears throat> when I finally look back, when I gave my heart to the Lord and I look and see how many times he saved me from death, how many times he saved me from falling off the high-rise construction that I worked on. Imagine going down for lunch and for lunch, having a pitcher of beer and then getting back up on a skyscraper with no safety harness, with no, at the time in, in, in the late 80s, early 90s, OSHA wasn't as strict. And so men were not always on the news, but men were constantly falling. Men were constantly falling from these buildings. You know, you've read about the Golden Gate, how many men died there. And men in construction, it was just like almost a common thing. And how many times I remember, and at the time I was in the world, <clears throat> And at the time I was little, but, but I had a grandmother who believed in the power of prayer, who fasted for me. And I had nothing to do with, you know, I had nothing against God, but I just, I just loved the world. And yet the prayers of a faithful woman preserved me from falling unto death many times. You know, that, and that's what prayer does. <clears throat> prayer, the Lord listens to the prayer. What does it say in James? Right? It, this is why prayer prevails, because our the many benefits from being faithful to the Lord, from being converted. Now our prayers are heard, and the Lord responds on, to our prayer, not because of the condition of the person you're praying, but because he hears your prayer. I, I was not, a, even today, I don't deserve being alive, but the Lord did not preserve me from death because I was praying every day and, and consecrating myself to the morning, but more because he was listening to the prayer of a faithful grandmother. And he would send his angels, watch over Sam, because a faithful servant has come unto me. See, this is the battle between Satan and, and Christ. The devil wants to take my life, doesn't he? The devil wanted me dead, but Jesus said, no, there's someone praying for him. This is the means of heaven's success. He cannot fall. You need to protect him. And there was one time I remember we were on the 13th floor, and we were doing what is called, you know, loosening the, the gang forms, ready to take him up to the next level. And I remember, I, 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 they would swing open because you would do these columns, and I was always at the top, and, and we were going ready to set the 14th floor. And I pushed, we would have to give it a gentle push because it was hooked to the crane, and the crane would trolley it out, uh, take it up, and then bring it back on the building. And as I pushed this form, it was very loose. Normally, they were tight, so you know, I'd have to budge it out from the concrete. And I pushed it out, and I was at the edge of the building, and when I pushed it, it was so light, the crane had trolleyed out too far, so the form kind of just took off on its own. So I had this, and I had my hands on it, and I was going with the form, and when I looked out, all I did was take a deep breath, and my body was already leaning out. When that happens, there's no momentum. There's nothing you can do to bring yourself back in. 
And I took a deep breath. <gasps> and, I, and, and today I don't, I, I, can't, I won't tell you that I saw a hand or I saw an angel. I didn't see any of that, brothers and sisters. All I knew is that I came back to the building. I came back and I, and I fell on the floor. And there was scaffold behind me because scaffold was used to hold the concrete from the floor above. And then they, they would call me on the radio, uh, Sam, are, are we ready to pull the forms up? And I couldn't answer. I, I, I was mute for about 15, 20 minutes. They came down and they asked me, are you okay? I, I was just coming kind of dumbfounded. You know, I, I couldn't even speak. I was speechless. And, and, and that did not record in my mind at the time. The Lord saved me. I just said, man, that was a close call. But it bothered me for so many months how I was supposed to die, and I didn't die. And that's why when I, when, when, when I began to see and study Jesus and, and I began to hear the words for the first time, it felt so beautiful and so fresh that Jesus had loved me so much. He loved me so much. I said, Lord. And, and, and this has to be what draws us to Christ. It's not the threats. It's not the warnings. They are necessary. They are very necessary. But it has to be the love that draws us to Jesus. This will provoke the righteousness that he wants us to live by. This is righteousness by faith. The world's Redeemer had a, great, had a greater than angelical nature, did he not? <clears throat> but listen to this. Yet united with his divine majesty were meekness and humility that attracted all to himself. You want to be attractive? It's not about your hair. It's not about your clothes, your shoes. It's not about your house. It's not even about your, your, your home in the country, your outpost. The beauty of Jesus was what? Was the meekness and humility was what he attracted people to, uh, attracted people to him. Blessed are the meek, for they shall what? Inherit the earth. Jesus emptied himself. We talked last night about emptying self. Did we now? We heard about it from Brother Marcus. Jesus is not asking you to do something that he did not do. It would be unfair. Jesus emptied himself, and in all that he did, self did not appear. Can you imagine that? that we finally get to the point where everything that I do, self does not appear. Oh, we have to long that, brothers and sisters. That anything that I do, self does not appear. He subordinated all things to the will of his Father. We struggle with subordination. We struggle with subordination. We're going to eat this again? We got to do this again? We got to leave to the country? We got to this, that, whatever. We, st we struggle with subordination, with submitting to the will of Christ. I, I, but I just started my career. Let me at least get a few years and then I'll go to the country. Let the kids grow up a little bit. All of that, it ends in chaos. The longer we prolong it, you know, it's, it's, like, it's like an infection. What happens if you don't attend to that infection? Does it get better? It only gets worse. That's why leprosy <clears throat> was considered uh, is, is, is a type of sin. Le leprosy didn't get better. <clears throat> leprosy, and there was no cure for it. There's no cure for sin. Except who? Through Jesus. He is the only one. Amen. And why, does, why is this tied? It's interesting. I asked myself, why is meekness tied to inheriting the earth? Before we go there, I want to read one more quote. Human nature is ever struggling for expression. Human nature is ever struggling for expression. We want to be heard. I, get it, I got to get my two cents into it. I got to get my words in there. I, 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 I got something to say too. 
ready for contest. But he who learns of Christ is emptied of self, of pride, of love for supremacy, and there is silence in the soul. You know, sometimes inside there's a little man in there just jumping, and I got to say something. I just got to say something. You know, you know what I'm talking about. Your heart starts pounding. He says, I, I can't wait till it's my turn to talk. Oh, I got something to say. Oh, I got something to say. Oh, you wait. You wait. I'm going to get you. Isn't that the, the, the nature of supremacy, just wanting to say something? I can't wait till I get him alone. I got something for him. You know, the soul is just to be quiet when Christ brings. Let the Lord handle it. There's a time to speak, and there's a time to... Excuse the expression, shut up. We got to learn to shut up. I got to learn to shut up. My mouth continues sometimes to get me in trouble. Yes, it does. And that's why I got to continue, like I said before. And I'll say it again. Family, sit down. I don't think dad has been expressing the right role that he should. Will you forgive me? You know, kids are more anxious to forgive a father and hug him and embrace him when he can recognize his wrong, then if we just kind of brush it off and say, ah, they don't know, what, they don't know what's going on. You will, you will make a bond of love with your children much more than back in the old days. You know, by, <clears throat> in, 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 in Mexico, in, we have a, a way of <clears throat> expressing the way a father disciplines his, his son. It's called coscorrones. Coscorrones is when, on the head, ah, mm, una chancleta. Mother would take a shed and love it. Ah, all right, mother. All right. <clears throat> you know, parents were not wrong when I was a kid. It's what they say. <laughs> and that's it. But, but at home, we have what's called, what's called accountability. I have to be, my words have to line up with my actions, and my children have a respectful right to bring to my attention or to mother's attention, mother, Wait a minute. Isn't that what we said we're not to do? And, and I'll tell you what, it's very humbling when your children have to bring to your attention that you're not doing what you said. It's very humbling. But remember what I said, that iron sharpens iron. The Bible says, and man sharpens man. These are the little men that God is using to sharpen this man. You know, I, it's funny. I remember, um, I'll take a quick pause there. You remember the movie Moses, right? The Ten Commandments? There was a part there that I always, I liked because it was interesting to me that this is what God, you know, the, author, his, the author's name was uh, Cecil B. DeMille, DeMille. And you remember him, he was always uh, taking pauses to, to, to uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the, the narrator. Uh, and he would always take pauses throughout the movie, you know, in, in scenes where they were not talking. This film was in 1956. It, where Charleston Hudson was, was, was played the role of Moses. And, and, and there was a part that I always liked, you know, when I started watching, the, when I watched that movie, that was interesting. It was, and it's when, <clears throat> when uh, Ramses takes uh, Moses and, and he releases him in the desert. You remember that? I, I know everybody here has watched that. Don't act like you haven't. <clears throat> and, and he releases him into the desert. And, and when he releases him to the desert, you know, he tells him, you know, you'll no longer die of my, my, by my hand. If you die, you die in the hands of your God, and he releases them. And Moses begins his journey in the desert, and he begins to walk. But there's a part that, that just, and, and, and my kids didn't understand, but I rewrited it, and then I watched it twice. And I like this part, and I'll repeat to you what the narrator said. When Moses is walking, and he's finally out of water, and he's now finally starting to get weak, and then he finally falls, and he lands right on the, on the ground. The narrator says, this is what he says, he is driven out. The burning, he, he has driven out the burning crucial desert where holy men and prophets are cleansed and purged for God's great purpose. He says, Un, until at last, this is when Moses falls on the ground, at the end of human strength, beaten into the dust from which he came, the metal is finally ready for the maker's hand. And I, used, I used to love that part. I used to love to hear that. I said, it is not until we are beaten until the ground that we are now ready for the maker's hand. This is what Jesus, now, 
Jesus is the only one that can do this. Don't you go beating people to the ground. <laughs> you know, this is not what Jesus is telling us to do. But Jesus has a way of doing it in such a way that it is less painful. You know, if, if I needed an operation, I love my wife, but I would not have her do an operation on my arm. I will go to a doctor who is specialized in operations. Honey, I love you. But this operation needs to be done by a, by a professional doctor. And Jesus is the professional doctor who the only one that can take us and, and, and reverently, I say, beat us to the ground and then get us ready so that finally he can mold us to what he wants. I want to continue to read. Human nature is ever struggling for expression and ready to contest. But he who learns from Christ is emptied of self, of pride, of love for supremacy, and there is silence in the soul. Self is yielded to the disposal of the Holy Spirit. Then we are not anxious to have the highest place. I remember sitting in a church board meeting. I'm not going to say what church or when and at what time. And the other who was there for many years they said if he could be head deacon, they had someone else in mind for eldership. His response was, uh, if I'm not first elder, there's, there's no room for me here. And he said it calmly, almost as if it was meek. I said, brethren, if, if I can't be first elder, then you don't need me here. I, and I was new. I was just, just a few years in the church, and I was already... They had gotten me in some department, and I said, that, that's kind of strange. Why, why would he say that? I didn't fully understand it, but, you know, we can pretend to be meek. You know, just sometimes because you're quiet doesn't mean you're meek. First, it could be be quiet, and as soon as you push the wrong button, you know, people say, look, I'm very meek. Just don't mess with me. <laughs> well, that's not meek. That's not meek. I'm very lowly and quiet. Just don't get in my way, and we'll be fine. No, no, that's not me. That's not me. We have no ambition to crowd and elbow ourselves into notice. Just trying to get your way. Let, let, let me get in there. Let me get my piece in there. But we feel that our highest place is at the feet of our Savior. That's what I need. That's what you need. That's what we need. We need to know that the best place for me to be is at the feet of Jesus. You know, when Jesus crossed Galilee to Decapolis with the Gadareneans, you remember the demonic man, one gospel priest says there's one or two, that's irrelevant. But the, the, the demonic man, it's very interesting, when the demonic man was, 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 was cutting himself, he, he, was, he was afflicting pain upon himself, he had lost his mind, he was a lunatic. And you remember when Jesus gets off the boat, you know, the disciples, they run, they get back on the boat, and, 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 and there the demons had to stop where Jesus was at. But what's beautiful about that story is when you read at the end that once Jesus had casted out those demons and put them into this herd of pigs, it says, the Bible says that he was at the feet of Jesus and in his right mind. We are not at our right mind, brothers and sisters, unless we are at the feet of Jesus. It is the only place to be at our right mind at the feet of Jesus. Why does Jesus say they will inherit the earth? The meek shall inherit the earth <clears throat> is what through the desire of self-exaltation that sin entered into the world and our first parents lost the dominion over this fair earth, their kingdom. In other words, it was because of selfishness that earth was lost. And so Jesus is now promising that if we seek after the meekness of Christ and we take upon his yoke, this new earth, heaven, we're going to enjoy for a thousand years, and then we will come back to this earth, and this earth once again will be our home. You will regain earth because out of selfishness it was lost, and now out of selflessness it is regained. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> it is through the self 
abnegation that Christ redeems what was lost. And he says we are to overcome as he did. Through humility and self-surrender, we may become hearers with him when the meek shall inherit the earth. <clears throat> Jesus never get, asks us to do something. He doesn't have to reward us. You know, Jesus could say, be meek, and end it at that. <clears throat> you know, when I read the beat these Beatitudes, you know, first of all, Jesus is dealing with such a difficult individual as myself. Then he implores me with love to come unto him. Then he promises me to give something to me. He doesn't have to. You know, the Bible says that God is perfect and righteous in all his works. So he could have said, you know, this is what you will do, and end of story. But he continues to ask, and he continues to give. Jesus always asks and gives. You know, and, and isn't that a Bible principle? Exchange evil for good? Jesus doesn't want to take away your diet. He doesn't want to take away your fried chicken. He wants to tell you, look, why don't you try this? Let me give you some education about what I'm offering you. It's going to be healthier for you. It's going to clear your mind. You're going to live longer to enjoy your children and your wife. You're going to be happier not only inside but outside. Why don't you try it? It's very good. You know, it'd be different if that's the way we, we approach our children. You know, what happens when you take uh, a, a piece of candy or, or something from a child? They yarn, they cry. But if you tell a child, hey, look what I have. Look what I have. Oh, what a, yeah, let me have that, and I'll give you this. Then, then they'll exchange it, won't they? And then they'll give you that, and then, oh, you know. That's what God tries to do. That's why the Bible says if we are not as little children, we think we're too adult. Wow, you can't get me. Either. No, no, no. We need to be as children. Yes, Lord. Yes, yes, what you have is better. I want to try that. You know? We need to be gentle even in health reform. We cannot beat somebody over the head because they're still eating steak. Maybe they don't know. Maybe they're struggling. Have you prayed for them? How much time do you spend praying for those that you see that are facing these problems? That's why I said make a list. Whatever you see, whatever you hear. You know, I think that that brother could use some prayer. I'm going to put him on my list. <clears throat> I'm running out of time and we haven't gotten to where I want to get. Let's move on to verse 6. Blessed are they which hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Is this not me the message of righteousness by faith? We long and hunger for righteousness. Not my righteousness, the righteousness of Christ. <clears throat> By the way, this, this, this encompasses all of our pillars of our faith. It encompasses even the state of the dead. Well, how is that? Well, if the old man dies, I should not speak to him anymore. Right? The dead know not anything. Amen? So this, this, this you know, we need to see that the, the, the message that God has given us, the three angels' message, the gospel is one message, all linked together. We need to hunger and thirst for righteousness. Righteousness, what is it? Righteousness is holiness, likeness to God, and God is love. It is conformity, conformity to the law of God, for all thy commandments are righteous. And love is the fulfilling of the law, Romans 13.10. Righteousness is love. And love is the light and the life of God. The righteousness of God is embodied in Christ. Where is the righteousness of God? Embodied in Christ. We receive righteousness by receiving him. The, Christ, the, the, the life that Christ lived is imputed to me when I receive Christ. And then the death that I deserved, and we all know this, Jesus takes upon at the cross. No human agent can supply that which will satisfy the hunger and thirst of the soul. You know when a person is sad, when a person is depressed, 
You know what they really need? That's why we say they need Christ. They need his righteousness. They need his holiness. They need his goodness. That is the only thing that will satisfy the soul. So look at the steps that Jesus has been laying out, laying out for us. He says, blessed are the poor. Empty yourself. Put self aside, as we heard last night. And this mentality, this state of mind will continue with you, providing, then he says, and, and it's going uh, to bring some mourning because you're going to finally see your sins. And then, and then verse 4, 5 says, now that, you, now that you've, you recognize your condition, now that you've mourned for your sins, now I want you to stay meek and humble. Stay there. Don't get back up. Stay there. Stay at the feet of Jesus. Now that you're there at the feet of Jesus, he wants to teach us to hunger and thirst for righteousness. As we discern the perfection of our Savior's character, we shall desire to become wholly transformed and renewed in the image of his purity. The more we know of God, the higher we will be, the higher will be our ideal of character and the more earnest our longing to reflect his likeness. If you want victory over sin, because this is what it is too. This is victory over sin. I said it encompasses all of our pillars. If you want victory over sin, you need to contemplate Christ. You can't free yourself from your sins. You can't change. You cannot overcome. You're just another statistic as I am. That's all you are. Except, except I come to Christ. That is the only way, brothers and sisters. Otherwise, it will be a heavy burden. It will be a heavy burden. To Jesus, who emptied himself for the salvation of, the law, of lost humanity, the Holy Spirit was given without measure. So it will be given to every follower of Christ when the whole heart is surrendered for his indwelling. I believe that the messages that we've been hearing, brothers and sisters, like I said before, none of us uh, that, that present the word here talk with each other, but I hear the message and I said, Lord, these are the things that are in my heart. He's trying to put this together. The Lord is trying to put this together in this camp meeting. Brothers and sisters, I pray and I hope that we can, we can get a better understanding of the science of what needs to take place in my life. And we can continue to see what the Lord is trying to do. Jesus is trying to take us step by step. He knows, and we know he's moving quickly because things are moving quickly. And we heard last night that Jesus is moving quickly. And he moves on time. But he does not want to leave us behind. We are on borrowed time. The precious blood of Jesus has bought this time. His mercy and His grace is at stake for us to have time right now. This is sacred time we're living in, brothers and sisters. This is borrowed time. This, this should have ended. But the Lord has said, wait, wait. Will we continue to make Him wait? Will, he, will we continue to say, like we heard Last, uh, yesterday afternoon just one more time just, just a little bit more how much more do we have to do to finally surrender to Christ Jesus has done everything he can he is doing everything he can and the door of probation has not closed yet but the Bible says that he is holding back the four winds and so our imagination has to be Involved in what we read and what we study, the Lord is holding back, holding back what is about to take place. He says, because my people are not ready. And he's inviting us. The loving, tender mercy of Jesus is inviting us. In Psalms 107, verse 8. We'll finish with these words. Psalms 107 <clears throat> and verse 8. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Oh, that we would praise the Lord for his goodness. 
Let us start there, brothers and sisters. Let us start by praising Him for His goodness. I don't understand all the fullness of Christ. I don't understand the fullness of the depth and the width and the profound immensity of His love. I don't. But I know this, that the more I learn of Jesus, the more I want of Him. And the more I want to praise Him. And for His wonderful works for the children of men. For He satisfies the longing soul. And fillest the hungry soul with goodness. You know, and that's the thing, brothers and sisters. When you're hungry, you're not satisfied until you are filled, until you are full. The soul, we need to realize, brothers and sisters, that believe it or not, whether you know it or not, your soul is hungry. The problem is you've been filling it with other things that are not satisfactory. But if you really come to grips with self, you're going to realize that you are hungry. I'm going to jump down to verse 15. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness. Again, you know, when the Bible repeats something, <clears throat> it's important, isn't it? <clears throat> oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Verse 20. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. What is coming upon this earth, brothers and sisters? Destruction. Destruction. What did my mother-in-law try to, the devil try to destroy her? What does this pandemic do? Try to destroy mind, body, soul, destroying your everything. Verse 21. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Praise the Lord. Do you want to praise the Lord this morning? Do you realize that you are hungry? Is self dying little by little? Is it withering away? Is the, are you making preparations to receive the Holy Spirit? What are you doing? What am I doing? Brothers and sisters, I don't want to get off this stage and then let pride start to set in. No, I said, Lord, please help me, Lord. I need more of Jesus. I need more of his goodness. I need his righteousness. Fill me, Lord, please. I'm so tired of self. If you feel that way this morning, I'll invite you to kneel with me. <clears throat> Father in heaven, forgive us, Lord. We have allowed self to grow into this horrific monster. And Lord, the only one that can tame this monster, the only one that can transform us, is Jesus. Please, Lord, I need you. My family needs you. We need you. Don't leave us. Give us your spirit, Lord, please. And we will be careful, as we just read, to give you the praise and the glory and the honor that only you deserve. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.